Hey, this is singer-songwriter Danny Horovitz, and you're listening to Citywide Blackout. Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Max Bone, and... Well, once again, folks, I am flying solo. Co-host Curtis Hughes is on vacation. I'll be doing the same very soon. But before I pack those bags and jump on that plane, the show will go on. And my next guest, he is a man of many skills. He is a teacher, activist, community organizer, and author. And it's for all these reasons that I welcome him to the show today. HD Hunter, great to have you here. And let's get to it. Absolutely. Thanks, Max. I really appreciate uh, you bringing me on the show, and I'm excited to be here. All right. Well, let us open up with the big news that you have a new book just about to drop. At the time of uh, this recording, we're about like 19 days away, but who's counting? What's the new title? (laughs) Tell us all about it, because I'm very curious. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, So I have a title coming out August 20th, 2024. So like you said, is is right around the corner from, from this recording date. And it's called Something Like Right. It's actually my young adult debut. So I've been publishing middle grade for the last few years, and this will be my first title through a traditional publisher for like that high school age of reader. I'm really just jazzed that I have a chance to put something out that's like a little bit more sophisticated, a little bit more layered. And it's about this kid named Zay who uh, unfortunately gets into a fight in his first month of junior year uh, in high school. And once he gets into this fight, he gets expelled from his district school and he has to attend an alternative school in order to complete the academic year at this alternative school, which is basically just a learning center where every kid from every other district school who's been expelled (laughs) has conglomerated there at that one school. Uh, and so it's, you know, it's not the nicest place. They don't have the most resources. And it's it's sort of a situation where a lot of the educational decision makers have given up on this particular group of kids. Um, but Zay finds uh, his first crush there, a young woman named Faven, and he's had a crush before. And so the rest of the the story is this balance between You know, him trying to find redemption in his personal and academic life and get back to his district school and kind of make make his wrongs right. But also exploring these new feelings with this person that he cares about and trying not to mess that up, but also knowing that there's sort of a a built in end date to when they can pursue that relationship, because both of them are, of course, trying to go back to their, you know, their rightful places. And so. We cover a lot of things. It's it's handling, you know, family dynamics. It's handling, like, romance between teenagers. It's uh, it's talking about the school to prison pipeline. There's there's just a lot of a lot of layers, and I think it's going to be a really cool reading experience for for folks who are looking for something a little bit fresh and different in like the the YA space. I can definitely sense the excitement coming off you, sir. You are definitely (laughs) jazzed about this, like you said. Absolutely, yeah. (laughs) What was it like, though, to make this switch from writing stuff that's more meant for, like, a younger kids to the more, to the the, the, uh, the young adult? Because obviously it opens the door to a lot more topics. Yeah. Funny enough, the switch was almost the other way around for me. Publishing is such a wacky industry in terms of how, (laughs) how the timelines for things shake out and You know, I actually wrote this book in 2019 at the same time that I was starting to work on some of my middle grade projects. But just because of the sales timeline and the release timeline, you know, this one is is just now coming out, whereas I've been releasing my middle grade stuff for the last couple of years. And things like this book, uh, you know, things that are more similar to something like Right are actually what I thought I would break into the industry with. And so I always felt like I had a good handle on that you know, older teenager narrative with those complexities. And I had to learn years back how to really write effectively for the younger group. Like I did, that's, that was where I had to sort of grow and stretch in trying to create stories for nine, 10, 11, 12 year olds, because I wasn't as experienced with writing for that age group, particularly with like sense of humor. When I was first trying to write jokes for 10 year olds, I was not doing a very good job. I had to kind of like reframe my whole idea of what's funny and what's not. And so this release is almost like a return to my original skill set. And, you know, I'm glad for the opportunity to have honed some other skills in the meantime. But 
yeah, this is this sort of, I feel like I'm back on my home court. I can tell. I can tell. So, so this book has basically been like percolating since uh, 2019. Did you find yep. yourself like going, like going back, like, oh, I should do this. I could change this chapter or change this ending. Uh, man, so much has changed. <laughs> like, I told my publisher last year, I was like, y'all are getting a way better book than the book that you bought. And I, I really feel that way. When I wrote it, I knew what I wanted to achieve. And I think that it was a part of the way there. But fortunately, I got linked up with an awesome editor. Shout out to Trisha de Guzman at, at Macmillan. And, you know, our relationship from an editorial standpoint has been so wonderful because she really does understand my vision for the book and, and offered me so much advice and critique about not how to change it to fit the market or to do this or that, but like to make the best version of the book that she knew I wanted to write. And so, yeah, almost the entire story has changed. Like we've added chapters, we changed the format and the structure of how it's laid out. Like it's such a different book. And we had so, like you said, we had so long to to tinker with it, almost too long. <laughs> but yeah, I think it was um, it was for the best. And I'm glad that I had a chance to take my time with it because I'm really proud of what we're about to put out. Was it hard to put it to bed to say, we're done, no more tweaking, it's time for it to, to uh, get out there? It's always hard in a sense because there are so many rounds of editorial. Mm -hmm. It's like every time I look at it, I will see something. And, you know, even when you give it off and you're like, all right, well, that's that's the last time and everything should be fine. Like it, when it comes back, it's like, OK, well, actually, I see more stuff now. So um, I have a lot of good author mentors and friends who are like, you know, nothing is ever 100 percent perfect. And uh, you have to come to peace with the idea that, like, you've done your best job and your book is somewhat of a time capsule. You know, you're going to put it out into the world in the in the state that it's in right now. And You'll go on and create other things. You'll you'll increase in your skill level and in your craft. And then you'll look back on those things. And I wish I would have changed this. So it's just like I take it kind of as a sign that, like, I'm improving if I'm looking at something that I wrote, even if it was only a few months ago and seeing ways to make it better. It's like it's a good sign. But I also have to cultivate that practice of not getting too attached. Mm hmm. All right, let's talk about Zay, your main character. We see the book through like their eyes. Who is Zay? How do uh, how do they get here, and what went into just uh, uh, creating them? Yeah, yeah, Zay is so close to my heart. <laughs> He's so close to my heart. When I was writing this book, I was doing it. I, I, the idea sort of sparked from listening to another author named Lester Laminac, uh, and he was long ago, 2018, 2019, he was talking about what the next phase of diversity in teen romance publishing would look like. He was like, there's a lot of straight white romance narratives, but there aren't many, you know, same sex, same gender romance narratives. There aren't many people of color romance narratives where there's uh, not an interracial relationship. And so even though all of these different versions of like love stories are great to have. There's an imbalance in the industry with, with representation. And also one of the things that he said was, you know, these, these tender contemplations of love and romance from like a male perspective. And there's just like not a lot of teen boy romances. So I got to write Zay as this like kid who's growing up in a rough environment. He lives with his mom his dad is recently released from incarceration at the time that the book is starting. He doesn't really have a relationship with his father. His relationship with his mother is strained just because they're under so much pressure. And so I think that that exterior shell of Zay is like, you would look at it and say, oh yeah, this is a kid who's supposed to be at this alternative school. But as you get to know him and as the reader gets to know him, he's like such a sweet kid. You know, he's just like, <laughs> he's so kind hearted and he wants to be so gentle and tender with the world that, you know, with a world that's not necessarily always the same way with our young people. And so it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun to sort of create this character that we don't get to see portrayed often for like young black males and to do it with like some style and some fun and some humor. And yeah, just to give Zaya a story that 
hopefully will dispel some stereotypes that people have, you know, when they read this book about this black kid who gets in trouble for fighting and goes to an alternative school, but then they get to see his inner life and see sort of the way that he thinks about things and how good he wants to be. And that one mistake in in his entire future. Um, I hope that people can not only see him in a in a positive light, but think about folks in in the in our real world that maybe have made a mistake or, you know, come up against some type of challenge that they didn't do well with handling, but it doesn't diminish who they are, you know, as a person and their character. Is the Zay that we see in this book the same Zay that we had in the beginning when you were just like drafting this? Did Zay like undergo a lot of shifts and changes? Oh, you're you're nodding. I like this. I like this. <laughs> this is a great question. Zay has stayed. I, I think Zay is one of the like only parts of the book that has stayed pretty consistent from the from the original conception of the novel. I knew I wanted him to have this duality between being a tough kid and being a tender kid. I knew that I wanted him to be like cool in the sense that he's a good friend and fun to be around, but not cool as in like, he's not a popular kid. <laughs> like he's kind of, he's got his little group of friends and that's kind of who he hangs with. I knew that I wanted him to be not the most confident in his abilities. A lot of his journey on his academic redemption is sort of figuring out like, what am I good at? And even if I can get back into my district school, like, what does that even mean? What is it worth? What am I going to go and, and do with my education after I've completed these grades? Uh, and I think the cast of characters that we build around him, you know, they're specifically designed to help and support him in, in figuring some of those things out. So, yeah, Zay has retained a lot of his original qualities, um, but I think the situations that we use in order to really shed light on what he's thinking and feeling have changed. and his arc got a little bit longer. The original version was, I was sort of putting him through the ringer with just like years just zipping through this year <laughs> and you don't really have much time to reflect on things. And one of the one of the elements that my editor, Trisha, brought to it was elongating the story so that we actually have more time to, to sit with Zay and his feelings and give him more time to process and kind of see what it looks like when a young teenager is being conscientious about making decisions that really will impact like their immediate future. You know, you talked earlier about how this is a very different like teen love story. This isn't the typical teen love story. Do you feel yeah. like something like Wright has the potential to kind of shake up the genre or is it just giving us a new perspective? Wow. You know, shaking up the genre would be really cool. <laughs> right. You would love that, right? <laughs> that would be that would be an honor and a really cool way to, you know, kind of not only bring light to my work, but I feel like I'm, I'm on my best days. I'm trying to write in the legacy of people that I feel like, you know, shake up their respective genres. And so, you know, to to have somebody read my book and think that about it would be really, really cool. I think at a minimum, I'm I'm definitely hoping that it can provide a different perspective once again, just from a, a gender perspective, but also because it doesn't follow the, the relationship doesn't follow the typical, you know, sort of teen romance arc. There's not like a big heartbreak. There's not like a huge happily ever after. It's sort of imbued with all the complexities of being a young person and not fully autonomous yet. You know, you can't really control a lot of the things you would like to control. Zay doesn't have a car. He wants to go on dates. You know what I mean? It's just like all of these really realistic elements about the best you can do when you like someone and not just in showing them that you like them, but also assessing what kind of capacity both of y'all have to, to engage with one another emotionally and trying your best to just like be good to another person. I think that was the message that I really wanted to communicate. And I feel like a lot of young adult uh, relationship tropes, they have this concrete endpoint in mind. Like I either want them to end up together and everybody's really happy, or it needs to be a heartbreak so that this character can recover from it in some way or whatever. And uh, yeah, we we have a, Zay and Faven have a lot of gray areas. <laughs> so I'm I'm hoping that maybe the new perspective that I can provide is is not new in essence, but 
a rare portrayal in literature that like things aren't always just nice and neat. You know, we kind of we get along the best we can with the situations that we have. That is very, very realistic. And I really like that. You know, I, yeah, I do but, like a story where I can't see the ending, you know, and some of these stories, yeah. you can see the ending from space. Definitely. So. <laughs> and I'm like one of those readers, too, where I'm trying to figure out the ending. So I'm like sometimes doing myself a disservice. I'll like be enjoying something. But then halfway through, I kind of figured it out. And I'm like, oh, well, now nah, <laughs> nah, I can't even really enjoy the rest of it because I know it's going to happen. <laughs> I should have just been entertained, but right. yeah, I think that I think that creeps into my writing style too. Like, I don't want to be too predictable because I don't necessarily enjoy stories that are super predictable myself. You know, it's funny. I'm reading a book right now, and it's like a mystery thriller, and I okay. hope, but I think I have the ending figured out, and I hope I'm wrong because if yeah. it is, it's like, <laughs> come on, guys, you make it way too easy to figure this out. But I, right, right. You know, I, I, I do like it when a book can swerve me. I like when I get to the ending, I thought, you know what? Didn't see it coming. And I love that because it keeps you guessing. Yeah, no. That's like the best, especially at the point that you're at now where you do think you have it figured out. And then if we get to the end and like we weren't quite, quite right, it's like, oh, wow. OK, yeah, this was you got me. Exactly. Yeah, I, I have my hopes. These are two writers whom I'm a big fan of. They do great work. And I mm-hmm. don't want to be, and I'm really hoping I'm not right, because damn. <laughs> <laughs> My fingers are crossed for you. Oh, uh, yeah. All right. Let's talk a little more about Zay. Are we going to see more of them, or is this a one-off? Yeah, so the story um, was sold as an independent project. Mm-hmm. And, you know, at the time of the contract, there, there was no plans really to develop out any additional narratives. But... Like anything in the art world, it sort of depends on how people respond to it. My agent and I, and in the early days, maybe, you know, within a year or two after we first sold the project, my editor, we talked about other sort of offshoots of this this universe that we could do. There's a character named Kenny in the book who he's at the same alternative say ends up going to and it's Kenny's second time there he's been expelled twice and so he's kind of like Zay's unofficial orientation leader to this entire like alternative school world and speaking of changes another one of the big changes from beginning to now is there was like a little bit of Kenny in the book I thought he was a interesting character to help make some connections from chapter to chapter and help Zay get place to place and literally every single person that read early drafts was like, we need more Kenny. We need more Kenny. We need more Kenny. <laughs> so <laughs> I had to put Kenny in like the entire book. Like he's from the, the second or third chapter all the way to the end because people liked him so much. And so we had some brainstorming about maybe doing a Kenny perspective story uh, and maybe even converting to graphic novel, knowing that this is a, a book that hopefully we'll we'll really be landing with teenage boys and that teenage boys sort of over index and that graphic novel readership uh you know demographic this could be something that might be cool to to transform into that and so yeah we we've thought we put some thought to different ways that it could come to life in other mediums and if the fans like it i think we'll have a good case to go back to the publisher and say hey can we get some extra support to you know kind of build this thing out a bit part two part two we can make it happen part two (laughs) how about the young adult genre as a whole do you think this is a playground you want to hang out some more in oh definitely yeah so i have this release for young adults uh in this year 2024 i have another scheduled release for young adults in 2026 and then my next two sort of projects that are in progress that I'm hoping to be able to sell and, you know, find a home, a publishing home for those. Those are young adult as well. So like I'm really leaning in (laughs) to this era and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, my agent and I can get some good support for the projects that we have coming down the, the pipeline. I definitely will return to middle grade at some point. But yeah, I've done I've done a lot of middle grade in the last few years, and I sort of want to just balance out. I want to have an equal number of projects in each category out in the market, kind of learn more about how different age groups respond to my work. Where does it seem like, you know, folks are really vibing with what I'm putting out? Yeah, I want to wait for like a good middle grade 
idea to come to me as well. I think I've, I've been pouring so much energy into it that I haven't really let my brain rest and just think like, what would be a different cool thing? So I'm hoping that some time away from that category will give me some some sort of like spontaneous um, stroke of stroke of inspiration. Enjoying the podcast? Get even more of the content you love from artists around the world on Citywide Bites. Experience the show live on Saturdays at 10 a.m. Eastern, only on Instagram. With our interactive short-form interview series, you can ask your questions and be a part of the action. Hosted by Max Bowen. I think this would work really well as a graphic novel because I'm I'm a huge comics fan myself. I read every genre that you can think of, and I feel like the slice of life, the drama genres do really well in this format. And from, in fact, some of my favorite series have nothing to do with like giant robots or punching aliens in the <laughs> face or magic or any of that stuff. It's just entirely reality, and just and it works well. So, my opinion, just this guy's opinion, I think it'll work. You know, I'm going to I'm going to take that to the bank. I'll, I'll get you on the phone <laughs> with my publisher. And you can <laughs> give them your expert opinion. But yeah. no, I appreciate you saying that because I definitely read comics when I was younger. I have returned on certain on certain uh, properties as I've gotten older and I do enjoy graphic novels. But yeah, to your point, a lot of the stuff that I read was superheroes and sort of speculative, which is not outside my usual readership. But yeah, I am just really becoming aware of that slice of life sort of graphic novel, as you as you call it. I wouldn't have thought about that being a market because the graphics are so vivid in the speculative stuff that to me, that was always my draw. And so I didn't even realize, you know, like I said, until a couple of years ago that like, there are other stories that are illustrated out that don't need magic or science fiction to be interesting. It's really just, you know, how the art brings the story to life. And so I, I am hoping that that some that somebody will see the value in that adaptation and maybe we can make it happen. Here's hoping. Now let's talk about covers because I'm looking at your website I'm, I'm, and I'm looking mm-hmm. at the cover of something like Right. This is a yep. great cover. It's powerful. It's just vibrant. Uh, what went into designing this? Shout out to Brittany Williams, who is the artist on the cover, and Aurora Parla Greco, who is the designer. They collaborated on this. I wish they were both here to talk about like color theory and all of these other sort of art concepts that I'm not super well versed in. But, you know, essentially I provided Brittany with the book's description of how Zay looks and some of his favorite articles of clothing. She actually chose the hoodie out of like a variety of things that I that I say that Zay likes to wear. And my best sort of estimation is that the sort of vibrant hues, but that are not in those typical masculine colors are like that representation of the softness that is within Zay. I think they contrast very well with his expression on the cover, which is, you know, it's not a mean expression, but it's you can tell that there's there's something behind his eyes, like there's a toughness to it. And so the the contrast of that tough exterior with all of these very warm colors and vibrant colors, I think they did a great job thinking about how they could communicate a lot just from, you know, just with an image. And I'm also hoping that young women readers will see the cover and think it looks awesome and say, all right, even though there's this kind of grouchy looking boy on the front, like, you know, maybe this is something that I would like to read too. Uh, because I don't consider it to be a book that's like just good for, for boys to read. I think that, you know, different genders can, can, can get something out of it. And I'm hoping that the way that we chose to, you know, package the design is able to speak to, to people from all different genders. Looking at the cover, the first thing I thought was Zay looks weighted. He looks weighted by his experiences and the choices he's had to make and what he's dealing with. Like right now, he like he does he does he does not look happy. He yeah. doesn't look sad though. He looks just like he's been through a lot, and this yeah. is a new thing that he has to overcome. Uh, yeah, that's that's a great way to put it. I think weighted is like the perfect word. So <laughs> thank you for lifting that one up. <laughs> Yeah, I, that is that is Zay. And I think it, even in the first few chapters, that's sort of the vibe that we get from his character. 
And so it's amazing that, you know, Brittany was able to capture that in such a visceral way that people who haven't even read the book yet can see that image and kind of understand who they're about to get to know. All right. You know, I want to uh, segue a little bit because we have talked about your uh, children's writing, too. Uh, you have yep. a number of books in that genre as well. Uh, of course, this is the Futureland series. You're now three books in. Yeah. And this is about the best place in the world, I think, because this is all <laughs> about a theme park where your wildest dreams can all happen doesn't matter Absolutely. and this is focused on uh cam walker and his family who have built the place they're the owners they run it i would love to know where this concept came from because this is such a wild idea wild and wacky concept for sure <laughs> but a lot of fun to work on the concept was created in partnership with daniel clayton who is another big name in the ya space um just has her hands on so many things like there might be projects that folks don't even realize are Danielle's projects, but she's had a, hel a helping hand in, in bringing them to life, both things with her as the author and then also things that other authors have worked on in collaboration with her. And so I was kind of brainstorming with Danielle and she was saying, you know, what if we had this, this theme park kind of vibe? When I'm around kids, I usually don't mention this part, but, you know, it was like she was thinking about Westworld a lot in the HBO show. And obviously that's not a show for kids. So I don't, <laughs> no, <laughs> you know, I don't definitely not. <laughs> that's right. I don't, I don't comp it for when I'm with a kid audience, but for adults, like the concept that there's this, there's this world with these automatons that are very hard to distinguish whether they're human or not. And they're sort of creating the experiences in the park and helping to operate the park. That was like the nugget of an idea. And we said, okay, well, what if we had something like this for kids? But of course it was family friendly and it was super fun and you didn't have to travel to it. It would come to you. What would be the very best parts of that experience? This super high tech AI driven, you know, theme park, but also what would be the biggest risks of an experience like this? And those core questions like after we decided that there would be a park that was like this, and then we got to populate it with different attractions, the two questions that really drove the build out of both the things inside the park and the narrative arc of the series were, how cool would this be? And what are all the things that would be great about it? And then like, what would maybe not be so great about it? <laughs> and how would we have to deal with that if things went wrong? And boy, do things go wrong. I won't give people all the details because <laughs> you want to get to get the books. But the first book is basically glitches. Things go south. Yeah. Things happen. I can only imagine what a fully AI driven theme park would be like with, you know, right. bugs in the software. This mm -hmm. wasn't taking forever to world build, though, did it? Or, or was it just kind of like, boom, it's there? Yeah, no, it took a while and kind of in a bittersweet sort of way. We had a while because I was working on this project at the end of 2019 into the beginning of 2020. So, uh -oh. you know, when the when the world froze, yep. it was like I had a lot of time to to sit with the concept. I was talking on a panel a couple of weeks ago about um, how I drew the original maps. Like there's a much better map in the front of the Future Land books now than a professional artist did. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I had a blast back then, um, not just coming up with like, and narrative outlines and character backgrounds and the different attractions in the park, but even just like sketching out what I imagine things would look like. Like we really put a lot of hours into, you know, how we could populate this thing and looking at different theme parks across America, doing research. I'm, I'm born and raised in Atlanta. We have a Six Flags over Georgia, not too far outside of the city. So took a lot of inspiration from that. I think that was like my idea for how big a theme park is. I was like, how big is Six Flags? And then, you know, sort of extrapolating that out. So yeah, a lot of time to research and to IDA and brainstorm. And that's my, that's actually my favorite part of the writing process. So yeah, it was, it was a good time and it did take a while, but it's like, you kind of do your, your work on the front end because all of that initial, all those initial deposits that we made in the world building space really carried us for the better part of three books. Like, you know, we did some maintenance for the second book and for the third book because we're switching locations and changing attractions to a small degree. But 
a lot of that original work we put in carried us through the entire trilogy. So I'm guessing there is not a book four? Not as of right now. Yeah, oh, we man. saw this as a... Wow. <laughs> this just we seems like it's a, kind of, it's a kind of series that could just, you know, keep going and going and going. It, it re- and I think about that sometimes when I see, like, authors who have, like, here's the 11th book coming up. And I'm like, I don't even know what I would be talking oh, about geez, at that yeah, point. Okay. Maybe not quite that far. Maybe like five or six or something like that. <laughs> right. I, I feel like five or six is definitely doable. And once again, the, the strange thing, maybe it's not strange, but it's been a little bit of a time dilation effect for me as like a sci-fi kid who loves time travel stories. Uh, because when you create a serialized work for middle grade, uh, publishers usually want you to put them out in rapid succession so that if a kid reads the first one in sixth grade, they can read the next one in seventh grade, they can read the next one in eighth grade and sort of keep that experience contained to the age bracket that the book is supposed to be for. So, you know, I've, I feel like I've been putting these books out super fast, but Futureland number one, was, which came out in November of 2022, was just named the chapter book of the year by the Virginia Association of School Librarians. And this is in July of 2024. So it's like people are actually still finding out about the series for the first time. And that's like, it's been strange because it feels quiet. And then things just happen at a different pace than you expect. And so there's a chance. There's a chance that maybe uh, as people continue to find the series and get caught up with the story that the publisher will say, hey, Maybe we need a couple more of these to, you know, keep the momentum going. But as of right now, yeah, it was sold as a three book deal. So mm-hmm. we have by no as November approaches, we will have uh, completed our, our contract. Well, you yeah, know, never say never, like they say. Never say never, exactly. right. Because <laughs> um, like, like my brain is churning here. I'm thinking like, you know, graphic novel series would be ideal for this animated yeah. series. I mean, the things you could do with that. Animated series. Uh, so for years, when I do school visits, kids would ask me, would you ever want to turn Futureland into a movie? And my answer is like, of course, right? But I would always say, I feel like it would be a hard movie to make because of the level of science. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it would just be tough to, it would take a lot, it would be very expensive. And just this year, maybe a few months ago, a uh, seventh grader in, in the District of Columbia was like, why don't they just animate the movie? And I was like, I don't know why I never thought of that. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> and you just said it. So y'all were way ahead of me. But yeah, as soon as he said that, I was like, you know what? That's actually the pitch, you know? Yeah. That's what we need to try to do. Yeah. So I'm I'm hoping. I'm hoping that uh, when we continue to build momentum, that that, that enters the conversation. Because I think an animated series would be so cool. Oh, so very cool. So very cool. All right. You know, I want to ask a bit about Cam Walker. Uh, uh, as mentioned okay. previously, he is our main character. What is his role in the series, though? Is he is he the hero? Is he the solver of the puzzles? What does he actually do? Yeah, I love this question because Cam is in a very transitory state of life. He's coming to Atlanta which is where his mother is from. And so because she feels more comfortable with the city, this is in the first book, because she feels more comfortable with the city, he's actually going to public school for the first time in his entire life. He's always been homeschooled. And simultaneously, he's starting to realize that maybe being the heir of future land and you know inheriting it and running it when his parents retire is not the only thing he'd like to do with his life. And then these glitches happen and kids start going missing and he finds himself as a detective, basically. And so it's like there are all these changes that are happening to him so fast. And in my sort of opinion, the entire series is about Cam figuring out what his role is in his family, in his friend group. And, you know, speaking more broadly, like as a citizen of Earth, just like as a person who wants to be in community with other people. And so from a technical perspective, like he's the kid that's going to run future land one day, but as he matures, he starts to realize like, well, I'm good at other things. I do have other interests. There are things that I'm not good at that it would be very useful to like, you know, have the support of friends and people who know more than me to, to help me learn certain things. 
he's finding his way in almost every way that a person can. And the end of the series definitely sees him stepping into that leadership capability a little bit more and, and sort of saying like, this is who I feel like I am and what I can do for my family and my friends and the part of the world that wants us to win over the bad guys. <laughs> but the first couple of books are a real deep contemplation of the exact question that you asked. And it's him trying a lot of different things to see exactly what his role is. Wow. Do you see any parallels between Cam and Zay? The main parallel between Cam and Zay, I think, is that they are both kids that are very, very genuine and very, very loyal. And they lead with those qualities in their friendships. Neither one of them has many friends when their stories start, but the way that they connect with other people isn't through, uh, we like to go out and have a good time or you know we like to get into trouble. It's like who people are uh, in their hearts and they want to be known. And even when they make mistakes, <laughs> it's that sort of like genuine approach to connecting with people that ends up giving them some leeway. People kind of look at it and be like, okay, like Cam may have done this thing that gets on our nerves or Zay may have like, completely acted ridiculous but we know that he's a good guy we know that cam is a good kid and i think that because i was writing these at the same time the first future land book and something like right some of those traits are definitely shared between them it was heavy on my mind thinking about that that type of that, that type of kid well folks uh, we are uh, we are coming down to the end of this conversation but hugh one more question before we go yeah. What do you see as your impact as a writer? Because you have, you have the Futureland series, you have something like Riot, you have a Torment, a novella, which last year celebrated five years, which is, which is amazing. Yeah. But yeah. what kind of effects do you see yourself having or do you hope you have? I think on a personal level, I want to be one of the best writers of my time, uh, especially when people look at Kid Lit from this generation like my push to myself, not even comparing to anyone else. It's just like, I really want to be the best writer that I can be. And I think that I have enough skill and enough willingness to learn that like I can get there. So from a personal level, I'm hoping that that is where I end up. And then from a broader impact level, I really just, I do it for the kids. You know, writers write for a lot of reasons. And then writers are also good at a lot of other things. I know writers that make films or host different events. It's like everybody or they illustrate. Everybody has like writing and then it's something that they pair with it. And the thing that I pair with writing, like you mentioned up top, is, is teaching. You know, I go around the nation. I do creative writing workshops. I'm a sub at a local school here in Atlanta. It's like my life is built around young people in learning spaces. And when it's all said and done, I want folks to look at my work as a, you know, teaching artist, but also my work as an author. And I want them to say, this person created things that were really meaningful for the readers that, that came into contact with them. It helped them cultivate a love for reading. It helped them explore the world in ways that maybe they didn't have access to before, uh, particularly for my young Black readers. It, it made them feel seen where they may have not, you know, really been exposed to a story that, that had characters that looked like them or were in similar situations to them before. And so, yeah, in a nutshell, I, I want it to be meaningful for the kids. If every editor and every publisher is like, yeah, this guy's okay, but the kids that pick up my work are like, we love this guy, then... I feel like I will have done the best that I could do. I like that. I really do. And with that, folks, that brings this episode to a close. Uh, HG Hunter, Hugh, thank you so much for uh, joining me. It's been a real pleasure. And for the folks at home, well, you know what to do. Uh, you go to HughHGHunter.com. It's all there. You get the books. Something like right out on August 20th. So just a little bit away, folks. Yep. We're almost there. We're almost there. Get your almost copy. There. And I look forward to many more conversations down the road. Uh, thanks for all the love, Max. I appreciate it. 
Thanks for all the listeners, too. Yeah, uh, I hope y'all enjoy. We'll see you all next time. And with that, we bring this episode to a close. Thanks for listening. And if you haven't already, check us out on Facebook under Citywide Blackout and Twitter and Instagram under Citywide Max. You can catch this and all your favorite episodes on your favorite podcast platform. And new episodes are added every week, as well as on Boston Free Radio every Saturday at 10 p.m. You get at me at citywidemax at yahoo.com if you want us to just a guest, submit your music, or just drop us a line. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you next time.